welcome to the 2013 Convocation Ceremonies at Transylvania University. Tonight, we're going to celebrate a very special event in the history of this wonderful college, something that happened 50 years ago in 1963. It was a year when long-standing social, cultural, and racial boundaries were significantly challenged and substantially redefined. Many of you will recall that 1963 was the year that the Beatles released their first album, Please Please Me. And some of you might recall that it was also the year that Betty Friedan uh, completely reinvigorated the women's movement with her wonderful tome, uh, Feminine Mystique. But it was in the racial sector where the most substantial challenges occurred. It was a year of incredible events as regards civil rights. Civil rights activist Medgar Evers was mowed down, murdered in his own driveway in Mississippi. Uh, we saw the Birmingham campaign unfold with sit-ins and marches throughout the South. Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, President Kennedy, gave his civil rights address in which he promised a civil rights bill, which unfortunately did not happen until many months after he was assassinated later that year. George C. Wallace was inaugurated as governor of the state of Alabama, defiantly proclaiming segregation now Segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. But in that same year of 1963, in the fall of that year with the new incoming class, Transylvania admitted its first African-American student, who is our speaker this evening. Personally, I couldn't be more thrilled that we have the speaker that we're all going to hear from uh, this evening. We have a tradition at Transylvania where we allow students to introduce our most important speakers. And so in keeping with that, I'm going to invite Zoe Snyder up to the podium. But before I do, uh, let me just tell you a word about her. She's a William T. Young Scholar, the highest uh, honor that we bestow upon incoming students uh, at Transylvania. She was recently an August term scholar. Uh, she is a Spanish major who also has a minor in philosophy and sociology. And uh, she's an exceptional young lady in so many ways. Uh, it's also interesting to note that she graduated from Bryan Station High School, the very same high school that our speaker graduated from 50 years earlier. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Zoe Snyder. Okay, I'm really nervous, um, but I guess that's completely understandable. Um, I've been given the honor of introducing an absolute icon um, here at Transylvania. Um, when I got the call to be asked to do this, I had already read the short biography of Dr. Morton Drews on Inside Transy. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, and I was convinced that she was basically the coolest person ever. So when I was asked to introduce her at Convocation, I was both excited and very intimidated. Even though many of you have probably read the same information I had read, I think it bears repeating. It would take up the rest of the allotted time for Convocation if I were to list everything on her CV, but I'll try to give you an idea of all of the amazing things that she has done. Dr. Lula Morton Drews was the student who marked the desegregation of Transylvania University in 1963. She graduated first from Bryan Station High School, then from Transy with a BA in psychology. She studied psychology at the graduate level in Erlangen, Germany, and got her PhD in clinical psychology from Vanderbilt University in Nashville. She continued with postdoctoral studies in Berlin and now specializes in the treatment of trauma, stress and crisis management, and women's and multicultural issues, among others. As if that weren't enough, she also served with the Peace Corps in Chad, Africa after graduating from Transy and hopes to one day return to the Peace Corps. 
when I hesitate, while I hesitate to claim any resemblance to her amazing story, there are some parallels between our lives that made me even more excited to introduce Dr. Lilla Morton Drews. I too graduated from Bryan Station High School, as Dr. Williams said, um, and here I am at Transylva Transylvania University now in my senior year, which is also very scary. Um, Transy has inspired me to pursue my passions, explore other cultures through study abroad, and learn foreign languages. I'm even currently taking German. But I can only hope that the rest of my life will be just as inspiring as hers have been. Let's welcome Dr. Lula Morton Drews back to Transy, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much, Zoe, for that wonderful introduction. I'm also nervous. <laughs> Thank you so very much. President Williams, Mr. Nino Marino, <clears throat> the Honorable Mayor Gray, President Martson, of Midway College and the Midway College Administration, Transylvania Board of Trustees, Administration, faculty and students, ladies and gentlemen. It's been so wonderful to be back home. Back home in Lexington and back home at Transylvania. And I am extremely honored to have been invited to join you in celebration of 50 years of desegregation of Transylvania University. <laughs> the renowned cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead once said, Never believe that a few caring people cannot change the world, for indeed, that is all that ever has. The amazing power of a few people to bring about change was vividly demonstrated here at Transylvania University and all across our country 50 odd years ago when the Civil Rights Movement was in full swing. When hope clashed brutally with hate, when people put their lives on the line and even children lost their lives, when step for step America moved closer to granting full and equal rights to all of its citizens, and when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to our nation and said things like, we must come to see that the end we seek is a society at peace with itself, a society that can live with its conscience. And that will be the day, not of the white man and not of the black man. That will be the day of man as man. And 50 years ago, in Lexington, Kentucky, change was also in the air. A small liberal arts school, then called Transylvania College, ended its policy of separate education and thus joined schools across America taking steps to overcome some of the injustices and inequalities which had plagued our country for generations. What was special about the desegregation of Transylvania University 
was that it provided a powerful example of a peaceful and harmonious transition. Like the 1963 March on Washington, the desegregation of Transylvania took place on what Dr. King called the high plane of dignity and discipline. We are here today to celebrate this transition, which I was privileged to have been a part of. And I want to share with you a little bit about the changes which took place here at Transylvania University half a century ago. To tell you a little bit about what this change was like and what it meant for me as the first African American to attend Transylvania University. And about some of the actions and the caring people behind this change. And about three factors which I believe are crucial to continuing efforts to enhance diversity and inclusion. Number one, breaking the silence surrounding our racial history. Number two, diverse people getting closer to one another. And three, finding the courage to social action. It was just about exactly 50 years ago when I ventured out away from my home on the west end of Lexington. I traveled only about one and a half miles, but to foreign land. I began to walk on paths which my ancestors had been unable to tread and to enter halls of education which for my people had been forbidden by laws of separation. Yet in those foreign places, I saw traces of the familiar. Familiar minds, familiar hearts, and I was hopeful. I saw that though distant, we were not separate, and that though different, we were the same. I was the poet Langston Hughes's darker sister, America's child, especially hungry from too much labor and neglect, but with the same dreams and the same needs for simple things like safety and friendship, love and value, and respect. And in this foreign land, people began to take my hand, and I felt hope for a better day, and I was happy. For the four years that I was at Transylvania, I was very happy. I felt like a little freedom rider on a mission. <laughs> I was happy in my small way to be joining the thousands across America struggling to bring down the walls of segregation and discrimination, to be on my way to becoming the first in my family to go to college. And I knew very well that my opportunities had been made possible by many caring people. <clears throat> by the struggles, the sacrifices, the courage, and the encouragement of my family and friends, my teachers and my preachers, by the people in my community, by the many invisible helping hands which have always reached out to me and by generations of people before me. And I was determined to make them proud. I would love to tell you an exciting story of battles and bruises, but this revolution here at Transylvania was more like the peaceful pink revolutions. Yes, I would use the letter P to describe it. The P's which capture the Southern charm of the women in my family. 
my mother, my grandmothers, my aunts and my sisters, proud, proper, and pretty in their fancy dresses and their big beautiful hats and gloves, <laughs> and the kind of southern charm which characterizes my home state of Kentucky and the states of the deeper south. Peaceful, polite, pretty, and pleasing. My years at Transylvania were wrapped in this kind of southern charm, which leaves you on the one hand feeling quite comfortable, and yet on the other hand wondering, hmm, did I miss something? On the surface, peaceful, polite, pretty, and pleasing, but underneath, as I can tell you of the silences and the tapping fingers of my mother, underneath often flow troubled waters. But we did not speak of such things in those days. And here we are today, finding the courage to break the silence. We are gathered here in joyful celebration, but this is more than a celebration. It is also a continuation of a journey, what I call a journey of healing. What President Williams, Mr. Nino Marino, and those of you in the Transylvania family and community who have worked with them have done, is you have prepared a year-long courageous educational program, still overcoming, with lectures and film, discussions and artistic presentations, you will examine the successes and the progress in civil rights and yet you will also explore some troubled waters. The troubled waters of our racial history and of America's management of diversity. As I remind my clients with an African proverb, we cannot heal what we conceal. We cannot heal what we conceal. With this year-long program, which kicks off tonight, Transylvania will be joining the many colleges and universities across America and the many groups and organizations in America and around the world, finding the courage to break the silence and to face the darker sides of our human history. As the author James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. I would like to ask those of you who have worked with President Williams and with Mr. Nino Marino to plan and prepare this year-long exciting program to please stand and show your faces for a warm round of applause. Now, there were many more. There were at least 30 students and faculty on this committee. I commend you. And what about the darker side of the history of that young black girl who first stepped onto Transylvania's campus 50 years ago? A history at that time shrouded in silence and politeness. My presence at Transylvania was not just about the college education of another child, and it was not just about another college ending years of separate education. Again, it was about much more, and these changes were steps in that journey of healing. Like my classmates, I was fulfilling the dreams of my parents, my family, 
And like them, by entering college, I was entering a new phase of the American dream. However, my American history was a very different one, as you've heard, from that of my fellow students. My fellow white students belonged to what the anti-racism trainer, Tim Wise, calls the privileged Americans. I, on the other hand, belong to the Americans who had been and still are in many ways, the underprivileged. For I am a descendant of the proud and strong people of Africa. Yet like most African Americans, I cannot tell you which part of Africa I come from. For my people were snatched from their homes, cut off from their roots, transported in shameful conditions thousands of miles away from their homes, and brought to this country and other countries to work as slaves. It is on the backs and with the blood and sweat of African Americans that many of the foundations of this country were laid. Yet neither money nor land, nor thanks, nor apologies were our reward. No, the lot of African Americans has been to suffer every imaginable human indignity for generations. Yet like people throughout history who have refused to bow to the yoke of oppression, step for step, up from slavery. As a poet, an author, social activist, and presidential recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Maya Angelou reminds us, we rise. And while faring considerably better in recent years, African Americans are still struggling for their human rights for their rights as human beings and as Americans in every possible sphere, whether in housing, education, employment, income, health care, or the criminal justice system. Yes, there is still much to overcome. With this look at the darker side of my history, I have allowed you to come closer to what moves and motivates me. Diverse people coming closer to one another is the second component of this journey of healing, which I want to talk about with a story. I've talked about the importance of breaking the silence, and now I want to talk about diverse people moving closer to one another. Racism and prejudice thrive on our staying separate. The law mandated an end to separate education in America. It was, however, diverse people at Transylvania and across America finding the courage to move closer to one another who gave life to words on paper. My fellow students and I were among the people demonstrating that change. We moved closer to one another in many major ways. What seems routine today was at that time, 50 years ago, quite daring. I lived in the dormitory with my fellow students. We ate together, we sat next to each other in classes and shared many school activities. And yet, we remained separate in many ways as well. For I knew very little about most of the people I ate with and sat next to, and most of them knew very little about me. I was that little freedom rider on a mission and wearing the mask of the, Paul, of the poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. She sat silent and still 
in her Freedom Rider costume. She was there, she was close, but in her own private room. I did make a number of special friendships while at Transylvania, but one in particular played a prominent role in helping to tear down some of the barriers which continued to keep us separate. One of my classmates began to tug at my mask and to ask, is there a person back there? Her name is Brenda Bell. Where first there were classmates sitting in the same rooms, a friendship began to take root, which for almost 50 years now has moved through the many rooms of our homes, our families, our activities, and our hearts. We walked and talked of myriad things. We built castles in the air and gave them wings. Brenda and I considered ourselves the social activists of Transylvania's 1967 class. And what Brenda initiated is what the lawyer, the professor, and director of the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, refers to as proximity. According to Stevenson, proximity, or getting close, close to difficult issues and close to diverse people, is, it, is crucial to improve relationships. It is when we get close when we talk to each other face to face, when we exchange stories and get to know each other as people that we begin to better understand, to better connect, to build relationships, to collaborate and to tear down the walls of prejudice and se segregation. To what, <clears throat> when we get close to those uncomfortable truths, as Stevenson referred to them, when we walk in another's shoes, we become challenged to grow. When we get close to those uncomfortable truths, when we walk in another's shoes, we begin to know important things like Though of different histories and different hues, we all suffer from time to time from the blues. Though often like day and night in our plight, it is our faith of many colors which to all of us gives light. Across our country and around the world, Diverse people are healing and rebuilding wounded relationships by moving closer to each other in all kinds of new and innovative ways. And Brenda, she's still moving in close to tug at the mask of difficult issues and diverse people. In her work in adult education, in places like Afghanistan, the Philippines, Myanmar, Liberia, she remains one of Transylvania's heroes, Shiro. <laughs> Please stand, Brenda. <laughs> Please. <laughs> She remains one of Transylvania's heroes, sheroes, who will not give up the task of trying to find solutions to our people problems. And in their 90s, both of her parents, the Reverend Wayne Bell and Mrs. Virginia Bell, both also Transylvania alumni, are doing the same in their work in Lexington and around the world. Would you please join me in encouraging the bells to keep ringing with a warm round of applause.
How different the world would be if there were more people like Brenda and her parents, more people willing to break out of their comfort zones and out of their indifference to find that courage to move closer both to difficult issues and to diverse people. Indeed, how beautiful it has been throughout history when individuals have found the courage to join in with other individuals, and together they have created the power to bring down the walls of separation which have led to so much injustice and oppression. Let me tell you another story about two such people, again, Transylvania heroes, who exemplify the third component of this journey of healing, finding the courage to social action. We're breaking the silence, we're moving closer, and we're finding the courage to social action. Over 40 years after my graduation from Transylvania, I learned surprising details of the story behind the desegregation of Transylvania University. In 1963, there were two seniors here at Transylvania, two young men, who like Dr. King, had a dream. They were aware of and sympathetic to the various activities of the civil rights movement here in Lexington and across our country. However, as about to be graduates of Transylvania, these young men had things to do, things to prepare. They were poised to enter the ranks of the movers and shakers as many of Transylvania's alumni before them had done. Something, however, interrupted their busyness and they found time in their personal journeys to take a road less traveled. It is this road which led to the desegregation of Transylvania, then Transylvania College in 1963. And it is to these brave young men, Mr. Patrick Malloy and Mr. Michael Mitchell, that I, you, <laughs> Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, owe oh, a major debt of gratitude. And their story is a lovely one. Again, of the beauty and the power of a few caring people to bring about change. Back in 1963, Transylvania had made gestures in this direction, but had not yet taken steps to end separate education. This hesitation had consequences. There were financial repercussions because of the expectations of potential donors, and it could have raised questions about Transylvania's commitment to civil rights. Mr. Malloy and Mr. Mitchell realized that Transylvania could wait for change to come to its door, or that it could recognize the advantage to proactively initiating change. Someone needed to step up to the plate. And it is these two men who found that courage. They decided to initiate a search for an African American to apply to Transylvania. And lo and behold, <laughs> their search led them to me. Moreover, I had not simply received a scholarship from the college as I had assumed all those years. It was the young graduate, Mr. Malloy, who had paid for my entire education. By the way, both Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Malloy did move on to join the movers and the shakers. They have both had very distinguished careers as lawyers and as champions of civil rights 
and as politicians. Mr. Mitchell has argued cases as far as the Supreme Court, and Mr. Malloy served two presidents, President Carter and President Clinton, as attorney and assistant attorney, U.S. attorney and assistant attorney for Kentucky, Idaho, and Texas. Would you please give a warm round of applause and sincere thanks to Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Malloy. Would you please stand? And finally, one last story about a group of heroes and sheroes who move and shake on a different front. Where, you might ask, does a young black girl get the courage to venture out to foreign land? She gets it where all our learning starts. She draws her courage and her strength from the heroes and the sheroes at home the batteries of that little freedom rider on a mission were charged by the prayers of parents, of family, and of a community who had learned from their parents and their parents' parents to never give up, never give in, for new hope is born every morn. I learned from a father who went into each day with a smile and with style and with determination to overcome. He was one of the colored soldiers and a veteran of World War II. He rose from work as an electrician to become an administrator at the Lexington Army Depot where he worked for over 30 years. And he served as affirmative action officer for the Army Depot and for the city of Lexington in the early 80s. And I learned from a mother, a woman of Southern charm and Southern steel, a very religious woman who knew that only the power of amazing grace and amazing faith could shelter the black children she sent out into the world's highways and byways each day. And I was raised by a village, a black village, of a large family and of many surrogate mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, whose eyes and hearts accompanied and guided my every step. For my parents, for my other family and community heroes and sheroes, I am eternally grateful. Would you please give my family a warm round of applause? <laughs> Would you please stand? Come on. <laughs> And so, you may ask, what does this have to do with me? And I ask you in return, when will you start to ring your bell? And you may ask, where do we start if we want to work to improve our people-to-people -people relationships? As you've heard from these stories, you start where you are. You start with what you have, 
and you realize that even passivity is a choice. To play a role in improving our people to people relationships and in bringing dignity and equality to all people will require that we find the courage to break the silence surrounding our racial history and talk about those difficult issues that need to be addressed. That we find the courage to move closer to one another and to take those actions which help to reduce racism and prejudice. And it will require that we recognize that indeed, as with our environmental issues, we are all in this together. And that supporting diversity is not only morally wise, but money wise as well. Every day, our world, our country, our communities are becoming more diverse. Yet in our country and around the world, racism remains a major problem. And conflict among different ethnic groups is rampant. The cultural competence, which was once a luxury, has now become a necessity. And each of us can make a difference right where we are, in our personal, in, in our professional lives, in our families, and with our friends, in our work and in our play, in our homes and our communities, to enhance diversity and inclusion in all the areas where people continue to struggle for dignity and equality. Dr. King reminded us that our goal is to build a society at peace with itself. I'd like to close with a poem. It's a rather long one, but I'd like to read it, and you'll get a copy. Um, it's called, Peace Starts With Me. Oh, the waters are so troubled. There's turmoil in the air. But I found a peace inside me which I really want to share. I searched in distant corners for the cause of our discord. I dug long and deep to understand the power of the sword. I searched in distant corners. I found many to easily blame, but I could not escape the constant signs that change was written with my name. Peace starts with me. Peace starts with me, it starts today, it starts the moment I choose a better way. Peace starts with me, it settles in deep, when I practice patience and kindness each day of the week. When I hold my tongue and harness my pride, when I learn to walk on the humbler side, when I tame my greed as surely as I control the envy, which often arrives with such amazing speed. Peace starts with me. When I see a brother in the other, though his mother is of another color or caste or creed, when I bow and give thanks for the bounty of earth, great and small, and sufficient enough to nourish us all, when I offer a hand to a stranger in need and hurry on before he can acknowledge my deed, when I give away smiles and toss laughter to the wind and learn to tame the flames of that fury that can so easily ascend. When the joking and gossip I refuse to join because the seeds of false rumors are easily sown and misinformation so quickly born. When I can say I'm sorry though I feel no fault and remember those simple politenesses which I was taught. When I learn to forgive and can begin to let go, though the wounds are yet to heal and there's still much to know. When I learn to forgive in faith and in hope, that when I take my enemy off the, roof, off the hook, 
I loosen my own rope. When I begin to see that my actions, though small with those near and dear, ripple out afar in support of peace or as fuel for war. When the jewels I collect for my lofty crown are not dependent on keeping you down. When I begin to learn that the hate I speak with lips so loose has an uncanny way of coming home to roost. When I realize our human connection and learn to value every soul. When I become the gardener of each tender shoot and the keeper of the whole. Yes, I searched in distant corners for the cause of our discord. I dug long and deep to understand the power of the sword. I searched in distant corners. I found many to easily blame. Yet I could not escape those constant signs that change was written with my name. Peace starts with me. Thank you so very much. I would like to thank Dr. Drews for her wonderful presentation this evening, and I would like to share with you something that we're all very excited about. Come commencement of 2014, the faculty of Transylvania University has proposed and the Board of Trustees has approved the granting of a Doctor of Humane Letters to Dr. Drews. And, and I, hope, I hope that you will all agree that it is perfectly fitting to ask Mr. Malloy to come up on stage and stand with us for a moment, because as it turns out, the faculty of Transylvania University has proposed and the Board of Trustees has approved the granting of a Doctor of Humane Letters to Pat Malloy. Now, some of you are probably wondering, what about Michael Mitchell? Well, as it turns out, Michael flew here from California and absolutely refused to be part of this. He insisted that he not be recognized in any way. He came only to pay homage to his dear friend, Pat Malloy. And so there is no honorary degree. Instead, in recognition of his character, we are going to extend the Morrison Medallion to Michael Mitchell, the highest honor we can pay to any graduate of Transylvania University. Uh, can you join us on Thank you all for being here, and please join us at commencement in 2014 when we'll have a chance to see all of these three wonderful Transylvanians once again. <laughs>